Good morning, church. I, uh, my fault, there was one announcement that got left out of there in the shuffle, and uh, it's my fault, but we are going to recognize our college and high school graduates on May 19th in the service. And so uh, if you are graduating or you got a graduate in your house wants to be recognized on that day, will you please contact Zach about that? Zach's right there. Y'all know Zach. Um, you know, one of the things I love about Morningside is that uh, y'all have so many different places to put your Bible for a preacher. Have y'all noticed that? You got like lots of different stands. There's, there's two up here today. There's, sometimes there's a table and a little stand and I'm pretty low maintenance when it comes to that. You know, something, some place to stand my Bible and some place for me to remind that I don't, don't walk around too much. They used to fuss at me about that because I'd, I'd walk around and the camera guy said, we don't want to have to follow you back and forth. Um, but my understanding is that this pulpit lights up. Now, I haven't been able to figure out how to do it yet. I, don't, I may need some power, some battery. We'll keep working on that, but um, that's my understanding. So I don't know if it blinks. Something to keep y'all awake, right? Okay. Well, um, Barbara has already preached my sermon, so this is going to be short. We are um, we're in a series talking about happiness. Happiness. God wants you to be happy. It's his intention that you would be happy and full of joy. And that uh, being in relationship with him, having this Holy Spirit dwell within you, being a person who has been forgiven of your sins, having your sins removed from you and being able to enter into relationship with him and enter into his kingdom should be something that is joyous for you and something that you should celebrate and want to give thanks to God and should be evident in your life around you, in your actions, in your speech. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, which means uh, complete joy. And he goes through these lists of things and he says, blessed or happy, blessed is are the poor in spirit blessed are those who mourn blessed are the meek blessed are those who hunger um, blessed are the merciful he goes through and these first several though um, seem contradictory to us and certainly did to the people who were who were on the outside of the group that Jesus was talking to maybe his disciples were starting to get it and understand it because of their relationship with him and because that they understood about him but the the folks on the on the outside probably thought this doesn't make any sense at all And of course, we've addressed this a little bit as we did the first um, beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. We have to understand what Jesus means here by poor in spirit. He means that we are, apart from the grace of God, we are empty. We are empty of any righteousness of our own. That we are, as we said last week, we we are beggar poor. We are needing the grace of God for us to have any hope in this life and the next. For if we think that we could enter into the kingdom, we must first understand that we are unworthy, undeserving, and we can't earn it. But God in his grace and his love towards us has has gloriously given his son on the cross to bear the weight of our sin, to bear the wrath of God against our sin, so that we might fall into his mercy and receive that forgiveness, that we would not bear the penalty for our sin. And so the first thing that Jesus says in the Beatitudes is that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven proudly. You cannot do it with pride. You must humble yourselves, understanding who you truly are and what your condition truly is before a holy and righteous God. But the good thing is, in that humility, we find joy. In that humility, we experience God's grace, that we can be happy that even though we were weak, He is strong, and he has shown his love to us. And so the next beatitude is, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There is, um, when we think mourning, we think of loss, a loss of someone. Um, And this word that Jesus is using is speaking of a deep sense of mourning. Um, And everybody in this room, and some very recently, have experienced deep loss um, in their lives. And it is a hard thing to go through. And some of you may right now be wanting comfort. Maybe the thing that you desire most from God, that he would comfort you in your mourning. The Bible tells us that he's near to the brokenhearted, and he does have compassion. We see over and over again that he has compassion on those who are hurting and those who are mourning. 
We see that as he looked on, and, and Barbara mentioned this, that as he went to the tomb of his friend Lazarus and the, and the people were weeping and wailing and, and in despair and hopeless, they said, if you were here, you could have done something. He tried to reassure them, giving them the comfort that Lazarus will be raised. Lazarus will be raised. But as he saw their distress and their mourning, he did weep for them. He has compassion on those who are hurting. But God's comfort in that is what Barbara already shared with us, is that God's comfort is that this is not all there is. This life that we experience here is not all there is. That there is a reward in heaven. That there is a kingdom of heaven. We're experiencing part of it now. We will experience it fully then. Where Every tear will be wiped away. Every sadness gone. And we will be restored to what we were intended to be. And so when someone's going through hurt and mourning, we try and comfort them with that. We pray that God would, um, would make that truth so large in their heart that it would bring them peace, bring them comfort, and bring them joy. That type of mourning um, is different than what Jesus is speaking about here. Jesus is talking about here. It follows, it follows just after poor in spirit. Those who mourn, the mourning he's talking about here is a sadness over our sinful condition. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. To enter the kingdom of heaven, to understand the things that Jesus talks about, and we've mentioned this, is that um, unless your righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees, and he meant it's not about the outside stuff. Remember, in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is first addressing that our character be different, that who we are is different. That our happiness is not just dependent upon our circumstances, it's dependent on who we are. And out of that humility, understanding our need for the salvation that comes through Christ, then we understand just how wretched our sin is as we look to the cross, as we look to what Jesus had to bear for our salvation, for our forgiveness. And our sin should make us sad. We should mourn it. Um, We should mourn it because it is not who we were intended to be. We were created in the image of God to glorify Him, to reflect His image back to Him. And His intention for us in this life is that we would enjoy living as His heirs here on this earth. That we would live out being heirs of the kingdom, living out in the image of God, that we would be full of His Spirit, reflecting back the good things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I memorized that when I was a kid, so you're going to hear it a lot. All right, But I love listing those fruits of the Spirit because it reminds me over and over again. God is growing us to beautiful, wonderful things. Wouldn't you want your life to be uh, identified? Wouldn't you want people to talk about you, that you are marked by those fruits? And that's what God's intention is for you in your life. And when we are sinful, when we are sinful, we remove that joy. We remove that experience from our lives. It is dishonoring to God when we sin. It is dishonoring um, to uh, the beautiful life that he's given us, to our families, to the people around us. And when I talk about sin, um, I'm talking about those things that we do that are contrary to God's will, yes. And they hurt our relationship with him and they hurt ourselves and they hurt people around us. We can mourn the effects of sin, and, and we do that, I think, okay. We mourn the effects of other people's sin on our lives. When somebody does something to you, when somebody hurts you, you can identify their sin very easily, can't you? I'm good at identifying other people's sin. Like, I'm, I excel at it, right? But identifying my own, sometimes there's some blind spots. Um, as we, as we think about that, we need to remember what Jesus, um, what Jesus told uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, um, he said, you hypocrites, right? He said, first, take the log out of your own eye. You're trying to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Take the log out of your own eye. Um, it's very easy for me to identify the sins of others, but sometimes I'm slow 
um, to identify my own. I, I ignore them or I make them trivial. They're not as bad as yours, right? My sin's not as bad as yours because I have lots of excuses for why I sin. Um, you don't. You need to be righteous 100% of the time. <laughs> you remember the story of, uh, of David being confronted after his sin with Bathsheba. If you don't, and I, I may have mentioned it here already, so I'm not going to go into all of it, but, um, but David takes another man's wife, has him killed, and then he's confronted by the prophet Nathan about his sin. He's confronted, he's given the story of a man who did something terrible. And, uh, and David's outraged by it. He's outraged by that man's sin that, that Nathan's telling him about. And he says, he should die. That man should die. And Nathan goes, you're the man. You're the man. Not fun to be confronted with our sin, but it's necessary. It's necessary that we, we see it, that God helps us see it. We see it for what it is, what it truly is, the pain of it, the hurt of it. And we should mourn it. We should be sorrowful over our sin. Yes, be sorrowful for sin in the world, but Jesus is talking about being sorrowful, mourning our own sin. After David was confronted, he writes Psalm 51. He says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are right in your verdict. And you are justified when you judge. It says, surely I was sinful at birth and sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop that I may be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Have you been in a moment like this where you know the grace of God on your life, but you have willingly walked into doing things and, and having attitudes and repeatedly things that you know, and maybe you minimized it in your own life, maybe you rationalized it away, you had all kinds of excuses, you hid it away, and then you are confronted by it, maybe by someone else in your life, but most importantly, you understood in that moment just how seriously you offended God. And you crushed, you feel like David crushed by it. I've been there. The beautiful thing is, out of that mourning, out of that sorrow for sin comes the comfort, the comfort of forgiveness. But God knew all of your sins, all that you have and all that you will when he gave Jesus on the cross for you. Romans says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love for us. He knows every bit of it, every bit of it. And so when he confronts you with it, it is not for your punishment, it is for your restoration. And there's joy that comes out of it. There's comfort for forgiveness, the comfort of forgiveness. We have to make sure that we don't, um, that we don't love our sin so much that we ignore the truth of it, the damage of it. My um, a small group Bible study during the week, and... There's a guy in there uh, who hardly says, you know, hardly says anything. He's just a uh, great guy, but he just doesn't say much in Bible study. Y- y'all know, y'all been in Bible study, right? You got, you got a couple people you're like, okay, all right, let, let other people share, right? That might be you. Then you got other people just happy to be there, right? Just, uh, just enjoying being there. Um, and a uh, great guy. And one of the other members of our group um, was being very vulnerable and, and confessing their ongoing struggle with addiction. And, um, and the guy who doesn't speak much, he, uh, he said, 
man, you just gotta, you just gotta, just gotta say enough is enough. He said, I loved dope. He said, for 20 years, I loved it. I loved it more than my wife. I loved it more than my children. I loved it more than the streets that I was running. I loved it more than anything. And then he saw it for what it was. And by the grace of God, he came to Jesus, found forgiveness in Jesus. And uh, it, was, it was such a beautiful thing. He, he, he talked for a, a little while. It was like one of those things where everybody else in the group just like, you know, and, uh, but he said, I loved it. I loved it more than God. I loved it more than my wife. I loved it more than my children. If you love your sin, you can be blind to the effects of it. You can ignore it. We want to ask God to <laughs> help us never be so in love with our sin that we would be blind to the truth of it, that he would show us as hard as it is, as hard as it was for David in that moment when Nathan said, you are that man. We should beg God for those moments. God, show us the seriousness of our sin, the seriousness of it in, in light of your holiness, in light of the forgiveness that we received in Jesus, in light of the damage that it's doing to our families, our world, our church. Show us, because right on the other side of that morning is comfort. And there's no comfort for your sin until you mourn it. You remain in it. You remain in the, in the damaging effects of it. You remain in the anger of it. You remain in captivity to it. You remain in the bitterness of it. But in your sorrow over your sin, you're comforted. And those who are comforted are blessed find joy because they know they have forgiveness of their sins and in spite of their sin God has loved them it's a good thing it's a good thing that God brings us to the place of repentance in um, in 2 Corinthians I want to read you a passage there um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 but just a little bit of background the apostle Paul um, wrote Two letters to the church in Corinth um, that we have in the Bible and the first one he was rough on them the church had lots of things that uh, that he could speak to them about there was a lot of mess in the church they were divisive they were uh, fractured up and cliquish they were there was all kinds of perversion happening in the um, in the church among its individuals the services had just become a mess people trying to draw attention to themselves making it all about them and uh, they would even during communion I think I mentioned this when we took the Lord's Supper they would they would push one another aside and treat people who were who didn't uh, didn't have the right clothes or maybe weren't in the same uh, social status they would treat them uh, as less than and make them go to the back it was just a mess it was a mess of a church and Paul didn't pull any punches he wrote to them and he confronted them and showed them the truth of their sin and you know what they didn't like it <laughs> they didn't like it and second Corinthians is uh, is a response to their coming back and saying Hey, you, you've hurt us. And in chapter 7, he begins the 2 Corinthians and he uses the word comfort. I don't know how many times, just in the first several verses, comfort, comfort, comfort. But in chapter 7, verse 8, he says this. He says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. And he says, though I did regret it, though I did regret it, so you got to imagine, Paul, he gets the response back from them of how hurt they are. And he thinks, maybe I was too hard on them. I have, because he loved the people. He loved them. He wanted, he wanted the best for them. He thought he was doing the best for them. And when they came back and said, you hurt us, you hurt us. He had some regret. Maybe I was too hard. He says, so even though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. 
Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended. And so we're not harmed in any way by us. Listen to this. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. We should want God to show us our sin clearly, the damage of it, the ugliness of it in light of His holiness. We should never try and minimize it or rationalize it away. And when it comes before us, we should mourn it. We should be sorrowful over it. Um, in uh, Christian, uh, my time um, in ministry over the last eight years or so, uh, we've had the opportunity to minister to a lot of folks who are um, coming out of addiction or incarceration and one of the things that's been part of the ministry, and Christy's very passionate about this, is that um, we get to see um, people's lives be restored. They, they get out of these situations and meet Jesus, and it's like obvious, like boom, you know? There's this crazy transformation that's taking place in their lives. They're just so different than they were before. And so they begin to see restoration come back in their lives over time, and as they, as they you know, are able to get work and... Um, and uh, and place to live and establish themselves and, and be active in the church and eventually leading in the church and, um, and deal with all their past stuff. And one of the things that, um, that is a, a consequence of their sin in the past is that for many of them, it led, them uh, it led to them being separated from their children, um, whether that's to a grandma or foster system or something like that. And Part of that restoration process is them reconnecting with their children. And Christy and I got to, to see that and walk alongside people as, as that's taking place. And, um, and seeing the great need there, uh, we just prayed and asked God, would you um, just show us how to be more effective or show us how to be more intentional? And, um, and then came across um, a here in Muskogee County in our family court system, uh, there is approved a parenting course for those parents that must take a parenting course to either uh, uh, go back to visitation or to gain their visitation rights or to have, be reunited with their children or um, for whatever reason. And so this court approved class is, um, it's, it's amazing that's approved by the courts. It is Christ-centered Bible-based, I mean, without, doesn't pull any punches, it's, the gospel is right there. Um, and as we walk through that course with, um, with folks, uh, it's amazing how um, some people have just not encountered, um, just not seen, uh, had it put before them, um, the effects of what they were doing in their lives, the sin in their lives. And so as we go through the class, we go through and, and we talk about, you know, family of origin and let's talk about how you were raised or how you were disciplined or how things happened in your home. And they can very easily identify the things that happen to them, um, but aren't, you know, aren't right away recognizing what they are doing to their own children. And through that process, they begin to see. You start, you start to see them. They come back and they, and they go, I'm doing what my mother did. I'm doing the same. I'm, I am doing the same thing my father did to me. I'm doing to my children. And you see the sorrow in it. And it's only through that sorrow that they can be comforted by God's forgiveness that they can be changed and transformed and that comfort could then extend down into their children and the lives around them. For us as the people of God, we should never, we should never shy away from the truth. We should seek it out. We should ask God, expose it in my life because I know I'll be happier on the other side. So this morning, if, if just through what we've talked about today, 
And hearing God's word, you know, you know you've minimized or trivialized things, your own sin. You've ignored it or you've made it about somebody else. Yours is not as bad as theirs or they made you do it. Can we today, as individuals and as a church, you know, I'm going to read you one more passage of Scripture. Um, having church conference too. Who needs lunch? This will be quick. Uh, Isaiah 61. This is the passage of Scripture that Jesus read when in the early part of his ministry. He goes to the synagogue and he reads them from Isaiah 61. He said, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. So this is, this is what I've come to do. Well, this, this word in Isaiah is to a people, to a people who are in, um, in bondage and exile, and the reason they are there is as a consequence of their sin. They were, they were put into that situation as a consequence, as a judgment for their sin. And so... Isaiah writes these words inspired by God. He says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Remember, these people, these people are in bondage, in exile. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for, uh, for the a release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness and a, a planting of the Lord for they display his splendor. God's intention for his church is that we would display his splendor for his people, that he would be glorified through his church. And so, yes, there's sin for us, to, for God to show us in our lives individually, but also for us as the body of Christ, that he would, that he would make plain to us what we need to mourn and grieve over. Because when we see that and he shows us that and we mourn over that, we are then comforted. And what we are led to is this beautiful prophecy. A crown of beauty instead of ashes, an oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. That's what God's intention is for us. We have to go through the mourning. We have to go through the sorrow for our sins. So let's ask God to not let us rationalize, not blame on somebody else, that he would speak plainly to us and that we, in seeing our sin, would be sorrowful but would go to him and fall on him for comfort and forgiveness and then have joy. Let's pray. Father, uh, God, we are, we are poor in spirit. We are in need of you to bring restoration to us. And Father, we have no hope in this life and the next. We have no hope to enter the kingdom of heaven. God, unless you bring us to a humble place where we recognize ourselves, what we are, and we see your holiness and your righteousness for what it is. And God, we need you through your word, through your Holy Spirit, God, to show us what we need to mourn in our lives. We would not rationalize, we wouldn't trivialize, we wouldn't ignore, but God, we'd be sorrowful over our sin. Thank you that in that place, you are a God who promises comfort Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's your promise. So God, change us. Make us a people who quickly and easily see the sin and are sorrowful over it. God, help us as a church, God. We desire to glorify you as a church, as the body of Christ here. Father, um, I pray this morning that if there's someone here who... Um, this first conviction of sin has fallen upon them in a new way today. They've never recognized themselves in need of a Savior. I pray.
pray that you would show them what godly repentance looks like this morning. You would help them to turn their heart to you for mercy. They would fall into the grace that you are offering them, Father, through the work of your Son, Jesus, that they would believe on him and be saved. God, will you do that work today? In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing together.